for those who have been trickling in, welcome to our event this evening, uh, Protecting Mother Earth. Uh, my name is Kai Hushka. I'm a board member with the Oregon Community Rights Network, uh, as well as an organizer with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, or CELDEF. Uh, the Oregon Community Rights Network is also the ORCRN. So if you hear me say that, that's what I'm referring to if you're not familiar with either organization. Uh, we really appreciate everyone being here this evening. Um, very excited about our our panel, our guests that we have this evening and uh, very grateful for them uh, to have given their time. Uh, just a quick uh, background just on both host, host organizations. Again, if you're not familiar, uh, the Oregon Community Rights Network uh, is an Oregon-based organization. Uh, it is a community-driven organization, so local groups really make up the network and sort of drive the uh, endeavors of the organization. It's really focused on trying to bring systemic change uh, for greater local self-governance, the ability really to control corporate power, uh, and then within that also push uh, the legalization of, of, of nature's rights uh, as something needing to be part of that transformational process. Um, they're doing this mainly through events like this tonight, uh, trainings, other grassroots organizing support, uh, as well as other kinds of legislative efforts. Um, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund is a uh, national organization. It's a nonprofit public interest law firm. Um, besides the legal work that it does, it also provides community groups with uh, municipal governments uh, with a lot of education, training, organizing support. Uh, and like the ORCRN, really the, the quest is to really more deeply transform our system of governance that we have today. Um, really putting communities in a, in a greater position to make critical decisions uh, and also to really transform our, our legal system uh, where it comes to the environment. Uh, and that has really come through this process of rights of nature work or legalization of rights of nature, uh, which actually has uh, an element here this evening with our, with our guests that are with us. Um, for those that may not have dug deep into the information about tonight, um, we are here to talk about protecting Mother Earth, uh, and more specifically to really hear from uh, people that are connected to the first peoples uh, of this land, uh, to hear what they have to say from what they've been informed around their culture, what they personally, personally have witnessed and studied uh, in relation to our conditions today, uh, ecologically speaking, uh, as well as pulling on information from, from yesterday and really each of them are really driving towards what tomorrow looks like. So uh, how that blend of, of yesterday, today and tomorrow really works in their, uh, in their experiences. Um, there's so much that we could cover tonight in our time. Um, uh, I think it may go uh, all over the place in a good way. Uh, everything from uh, environmental justice, racism, talking about treaties, colonial settlerism, capitalism, traditional culture, rights of nature, the doctrine of discovery, and so on. Uh, we really do have a, a great collection of people that uh, have the capability of, of really sharing some, some great information, I think some things to really think about, uh, and ultimately, um, I think stories really to affect our own behavior uh, as we do the work that we're doing. I know a number of you are involved in a lot of uh, advocacy work from what I've seen who've joined tonight. So I, I really hope you do gain a lot from this evening. Uh, our speakers are uh, Dina Jillio Whitaker. She's a Calva Confederated Tribal member. Joe Scott, who's a Confederated Tribe of Siletz Indians member and Elliot Moffat, who is from the Nez Perce tribe. Um, as I mentioned already, and probably will do it a few more times, they're all extraordinary in their own right. Uh, collectively, they bring uh, Incredible amount of wisdom in the form of being teachers, singers, activists, organizers, advocates, scholars, uh, obviously uh, first peoples, um, and really just people in general, humans in general, with with tremendously big hearts and and all they do and all they contribute on a daily basis. Um, the format for tonight really is is uh, ideally going to be very conversational um, between Dina, Joe, and, and Elliot. Uh, I am going to kind of get us rolling, um, and each will do a, a little bit of introduction of themselves when they when they speak initially, uh, and then really just kind of hand it off to the three of them to to carry us through the evening. If there's some time that allows at the end, we'll we'll definitely take questions from the audience, uh, but I think there's a lot for us to to listen to and and hear 
uh, in the conversation uh, between the three. Um, Dina, if you wouldn't mind being our, our first person to speak and um, as a way to maybe um, bring you into to tonight and, and some semblance of, of getting people to understand you a little bit before you, you speak, uh, I pulled a, a passage out of your book, As Long As Grass Grows, that comes in towards the end that I think is a, is a good potential setup for you to, to kind of explain where your focus has been and where it's going and the work you do. And it's the quote where you write, if American Indians are to experience real environmental justice, which means not only ending the poisoning of their environments, but also regaining access to and protection of their sacred sites and ancient territories, it means confronting a state built on the pillars of capitalism, colonialism, and white supremacy. Um, after you introduce yourself, if, if you can sort of explain what brought you to that quote through the premise of your book, sort of what set that up and provide whatever context of that quote that I just read, uh, I think that'd be a great way to kind of set the scene for, for this evening. And Dina, welcome and, and thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Kai. Why peace nux seal? You squeeze Dina Gillio Whitaker. And um, I'm coming to you from the traditional and unceded homelands of the Hashiman people in what's currently called Southern California in Orange County. And um, I'm a descendant of the Colville Confederated Tribes in Washington State. And um, in, in the ways that we introduce ourselves in our communities, um, like if I was there speaking to my community, I would say that, you know, I'm the daughter of Rosemary Burnett and um, Vince Gillio, and I'm the granddaughter of Mabel Dizitel and the great granddaughter of Ida O'Brien Dizitel and, uh, and uh, Gilbert Dizitel. And so that way I establish my uh, kinship and my connection to that community in a way that is transparent and accountable. So um, this is, uh, you know, part of you know, what we talk about as Indigenous peoples having um, a, a, a worldview or a foundation built on kinship and relationality. Um, and, and that being um, a, a, par a paradigm that's really different than uh, than the dominant society which views land and you know this is a good segue into that passage that you just read Kai um, about it's it's really points to this uh, to this very uh, radically different approach to the world or orientation to land and to the natural world um, with which uh, for indigenous peoples is rooted in uh, you know, again, the, the, these frameworks of kinship and reciprocity and, and respect and responsibility, um, which is why and how Indigenous peoples are um, fundamentally sustainable communities, having been on, survived on land and particular ecosystems for, you know, thousands of years. Um, and, um, but, but the processes of uh, colonization uh, are built on European values and, and systems that are diametrically opposed to that. Um, and, and these systems are, they're rooted in uh, this term that we use epistemologies, which is really just systems of knowledge or worldviews that, that um, are based on a, a a way of being in the world that is um, violent, that's um, exploitative of the natural world, that um, takes uh, it, it takes what it wants um, and uses it in ways that, uh, especially from the natural world, in ways that um, that are ultimately not about caring for the land, but about exploiting for the for the uh, processes of economic systems. Um, so that those that those pillars, those, the three pillars of um, colonialism and capitalism and white supremacy bring together uh, these, these uh, systems that have been, that are uh, foreign systems imposed on this land um, that, are all, that are new. So when, when we look at the history of 500 years of colonization since, you know, since European arrival here, um, that's 500 years is a drop in the bucket of time compared to um, the 15,000 years plus minimum 
um, that indigenous peoples have thrived and built societies on these lands. And so here in the in in that 500 years, and um, and really less than that since these economic systems, this, this economic system of capitalism has uh, has intensified and come really to rule the world um, based on foreign technologies, um, you know, past as, you know, the genius of the modern world of um, innovation um, it, that makes life a little, comf a little more comfortable, but at the same time um, just has led led us to the this brink where we're at now this brink of really of existence and to the ongoing um you know uh, the ongoing um extinction you know this what we call this six mass mass extinction event so so that's like the big framework that's a big picture of um what i look at in my work uh as an as a scholar as an author um thinking about what environmental justice means for indigenous peoples um it means it means and my argument is that it means different things for different populations and and so that's why we when we talk about white supremacy um there's a distinction to be made and white supremacy uh you know, is a hat tip to racism, but this this uh, this idea of racism um, that that we think about as being sort of like the root of all evil or the root of all injustice in the United States is really not. It's not a broad enough um, framework for us to think about it. Is when especially when you think about um, the violent taking of land because it happens. It happens uh, not because of racism. So the land is not taken because uh, Europeans are racist against Native people. It's it's taken because uh, it's it's it happens because uh, because they possess the land. So it doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what color your skin is or what you're in but ultimately it has to do with religion that's another conversation but um and that's where the doctrine of discovery comes in as you alluded to kai that um that this colonial system that we live in is founded on a logic of uh christian domination um so all of these things are tied together in these really complex but um really when you start looking at it really obvious ways and it becomes embedded in the legal system and that's why we call it settler colonialism as a structure that's how we characterize the united states um, as as an imperial project um, <clears throat> at the at the the core of of settler colonialism is this desire to uh, to take the land and then replace the indigenous population um, with foreign invaders. And so this is you know again the big picture. Um, but but all of that matters because because it became a legal structure that ongoingly reproduces these logics um, and that's why native people are constantly fighting because we're locked into um, these systems of profound injustice um, that are maintained through a rubric theoretically of justice so we have this thing called law which says that you know it it imparts justice but it really doesn't not for native people uh, and so those are these are the 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 conversations that uh, that we have to keep having and why we have to keep um, you know bringing it into to the realm of conscious and that that combined with the fact that being dispossessed systematically dispossessed of our our lands interrupts our kinship relationships to those lands which are what kept the lands healthy so so the the imposition of foreign of these foreign ideas and these foreign ways of managing land is what brings us to this precipice that we now find ourselves and so um so all of these things are necessary to understand 
uh, to bring that indigenous knowledge back into um, the, the ways that we collectively think about managing land. Um, and that's so much about what the land, the current land back movement is about, is about, you know, restoring native, native land management practices to the land, especially on public lands, um, but everywhere we can because we still have that knowledge, um, even though we have this long history of of this violent dispossession and this and genocide and and being almost completely wiped out. I mean, let's face it, this genocide was 97%. This is the most extreme genocide in the history of the recorded recorded history of the world. Um, but we've we've survived it. And, and we are rebounding, you know, in the last century, we, we are rebounding and we are reclaiming those knowledges, revitalizing them and re, uh, reasserting them. And so, um, so that's, so that's, that's where we find ourselves in the moment. And there's a, a real interesting opening right now. And I think that, that things are looking so dire for, uh, for, things in this, you know, at least in this particular country, that, um, that now we can have these conversations and have people paying attention and, and um, being willing to hear these hard histories, and um, have these, uh, you know, come to some kind of reconciliation, or <clears throat> however we want to call that. So Thank you, Dina. I think that that actually um, makes for a nice connection to to both Joe and and Elliot in the sense of of land and land management practices and, and health. And um, yeah. I think uh, Joe, if you wouldn't mind going next, I I know from talking to you in, in preparation for tonight, you know, you you do a lot for your your people as a as a teacher, a mentor, uh, a guide, in, in so many different ways through through song and story and your native language and, and other aspects of, of your traditional ways there. And I was wondering to, to maybe kind of come off of what, what Dina was just talking about, if, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing in some aspect of, you know, food and health and what that's meant to your people um, through, through the, uh, the impacts of colonization, but then also, you know, the, the efforts going on now that are, I, I guess I could term as bright spots, um, despite the, the oppressiveness of, of really the system that still exists today. And um, so, yeah, I think that could be a nice aspect. And then we'll hear from Elliot um, after you're finished. No la shri me yast a sho no ha nin la khi shri nisn mash hum cho sat khan hum dashyan. My name is Joe Scott. I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Salets Indians. Um, I speak as a Salets Indian, not for the Salets Indians. That's important. I'm the great great grandson of Melissa Lata Montgomery and our people are the Upland Tacoma people of the Rogue River Valley. Um, and uh, to the point that you're making, uh, I, I have to st um, start out with a little bit of the history. I'm, I'm right now I'm in, in the Southern Willamette Valley. I'm in uh, you know, what's called the Southern Willamette Valley. Uh, this is Kalapuya land. Uh, I'm not a Kalapuya person. I feel fairly comfortable on Kalapuya land. And, you know, my first words are essentially a blessing of this place because it's so beautiful here. Um, this is a tended landscape. And I think a, a lot of people forget that, um, that, you know, there weren't, uh, there weren't outsiders coming here and, and you know, a lot of it, it, coming into a, a pristine landscape. There's no such thing. Uh, and it's one of the things that I try to encourage the people I work with, the young people I work with to understand is that we have always tended this landscape. This is a paradise that has been maintained, you know, provided by the creator and maintained by us in honor of the laws of the creator. And um, as such, we become a part of this place we are. Uh, we are made of this place and this place is made of us. Uh, you know, when we grow and live and grow up and, and get older, we consume this landscape. And when we are 
uh, ready to pass on our, our physical beings, go back into the land and become the next generation. And as such, our genes have been mixing with this place since the beginning of time. And, um, you know, to, to put us as, you know, to label us as artifacts and to place us in museums and fail to recognize that, that our communities are vibrant and that what we are doing is real and that what, you know, what we are uh, accomplishing has been going on again since the beginning of time uh, seems to be this, this big discovery that's been made. Um, and, and, you know, all of a sudden the, the tribal voice is included uh, where the tribal voice is always, you know, has always been there. It's just people have a tendency not to listen. Um, <laughs> I was I was saying earlier uh, when we were warming up for this discussion, kind of, you know, I, I talk in my sleep and I've taken to like writing things down and something I wrote last night is very, uh, I think, uh, appropriate for this part of the conversation. And I wrote, the history of colonization is a corruption of novel concepts. So we've known these practices, we've known these things, we know why the fish go out into the ocean, we know where they go, you know, Don Daini, the people of the north, well, they, you know, you don't have to put a fish locator uh, thing on the fish to decide, you know, to decipher where they travel, um, you know, they go up into the Bering Strait, why uh, why did Native Americans and why have Native Americans identified certain places on the landscape as sacred places? Go there and explore the fact that there is an incredible genetic diversity there. So there's a science that has come in and discovered us. You know, our world has been here again since the beginning. We've, we've, we've been a part of this place. We are this place. And then along comes another culture and lays its scientific, uh, you know, discovery on us. And I think what, what I do personally is I work with um, tribal families, tribal youth, um, and uh, non-tribal entities to, you know, to try to come together and work to find places where people can explore those realities. Um, we're, we're very focused on um, issues of tribal and sovereignty as defined is the inherent right that, that native people to a, a place have to live healthy and productive lives. And I, you know, I just, it's one of those things that sometimes you don't think about very deeply you hear the term sovereignty. And I'd never really thought about it as a, as a physical issue. You have physical sovereignty to, to be, who, you know, be where you are. Um, and that is, again, that's, you know, these are concepts that are lost on people and it's where we come together as a group um, to understand, to communicate with, the, with ourselves as our place. So, you know, I encourage people to explore uh, food ways to explore how to increase the yield of uh, um, cultural uh, cultural material producing plants, medicines, food as medicine, um, and it's it's called the Traditional Ecological Inquiry Program. We work with the Long Tom Watershed Council, uh, which is an unusually um, with it group when it comes to including tribal voices in the operation of uh, the, the concept of land management, you know, and again, I, I have to return to this concept of, you know, land management is really self-management. So, you know, the rights of, of nature are the rights of people, um, you know, our, our ability and our, our inherent and sovereign right to be healthy and live in a healthy place and understand that place. And um, really, I, I think that's all I have to say about that. Well, thanks, Joe. I'm sure there'll be more prompts as we, as we move through the evening. Um, Elliot, I wanna bring you into the conversation. And then, as I mentioned at the, at the start here, really just let the three of you kind of organically um, 
work off one another and, and, and ideas and things that have come up already or that might come up. Um, I know, Elliot, that you have worn and continue to wear lots of different hats for your tribe. Um, and I know a lot of your energy around Mother Earth for you and the tribes has been spent on, on the salmon, on really the future of salmon, uh, specifically in the Snake River watershed ecosystem there. And I want to see if, if you would talk a little bit about what that is that fight has looked like for you and the tribe, um, you know, whether it's about the salmon or your people, uh, the wolves, really all of it. Um, and, and if you have a few minutes, you know, talk about why the Nez Perce, you know, put out its resolution last June on, on wanting to seek legal rights for the Snake River as, as sort of part of that conversation and part of what Dina talked about and, you know, about land and, you know, what Joe was just discussing about, you know, that you can't really separate uh, into parts often what, of course, you know, Western science does is kind of separate things into parts. And uh, I think what we're hearing here tonight is that that just doesn't happen if you're really in, in harmony and in sync. And um, I think you have a lot uh, to share there, Elliot, in, in, that, in that vein. So I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Kai. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Am I coming through okay? And um, uh, my name is Elliot Moffitt, and I'm the president of the nonprofit organization Nimipu Protecting the Environment. Um, um, my uh, mother and father are Walter and, and Bernice Moffitt, and my mother is uh, living here in, in the uh, Kamei Valley. Uh, where I'm calling from, um, and uh, I'm right next to about a mile away from the Nez Perce National Historical Park that one of their sites is, is our heart of the monster. And um, that's how the, the Nez Perce, the Nimipu began was from the heart of the monster. Um, and you can still see remnants of that heart right next to me. So uh, if ever, anyone's ever here, they can they can jump by and see the the heart of my, the monster where we began. Um, and um, um, elves, as Gina has said, that we have to um, tell how we're related and and who who my folks are, my grandparents. Um, and so um, my father and mother, they were um, are well known in Indian country um, through their through their work with with tribal governments. And um, we got started as a, um, a nonprofit about 2013 when there was the megalodes issue was, was here on the reservation. And that had to do with um, um, uh, large equipment coming through the reservation headed to, towards the tar sands of uh, Canada. And they weren't, it wasn't the destination uh, to locate in Nez Perce country, but uh, they didn't ask us, and and we felt like um, they should consult with us as a because of that. The if the equipment um, spilled into our rivers, then that would be very harmful to the fish and the habitat and our rivers. So um, we got started with um, um, the megalodes, and one of the reasons we did that was not only for um, protection of our territory, um, but also um, uh, I live up to tribal law and know that everything is interconnected. And uh, so we were, we felt like we are connected with our, with our brothers and sisters in Canada. And we knew that, that the tar sands were detrimental to that, to that community, those communities of indigenous people and the other communities as well. And so uh, based on that, then we got involved in, in um, um, uh, activism as far as uh, getting educated about these issues and um, um, advocating for our, our um, within our tribe for uh, uh, policies and procedures that would better protect our environment and Mother Earth. Um, so that led us into the salmon issue. Uh, because that uh, that that was coming up, we were were um, treaty rights, um, our Nez Perce treaty rights and responsibilities include fishing and and gathering and and um, um, and living our life ways, 
And so um, we got involved in, in the, in the uh, salmon issue and, and because of all of the, um, um, the dangers and the threats to the salmon runs, and uh, there's 13 species of the, of the Columbia River uh, salmon and steelhead that are either in danger of extin extinction or threatened with extinction. And so after all these years, there still has, you know, we still haven't figured out how to have, be able to bring back the fish as promised in the treaties. And so we got directly involved in that issue. Um, um, but we always have to say that because of the nature of our societies that we don't, as Nimi Poo protecting the environment, we don't represent the tribe, the, the tribal government but um, we speak out on issues that um, uh, relate to tribal sovereignty and, and our jurisdiction, because in that way, we feel that we can uh, uh, advance some of our more, our, our tribal laws, our more traditional laws about how we, how we live in harmony with Mother Earth. So um, we sponsored the motion to the General Council to recognize the rights of the Snake River and um, that the general council adopted that resolution. Now that will go to the tribal executive committee and it has gone to them and we'll be working with them to see how that actually works out in, in our manage, management regimes within our reservation because we have to do, we have to do this and uh, we can't just be requiring others to do uh, that kind of that kind of work, that kind of policy development with us, without us um, taking those necessary steps as well. So um, that's basically where we are right now is uh, we have the resolution. Um, I believe that, the, that there are uh, steps that are going to be taken to um, uh, ask the affiliated tribes of the Northwest Indians to make us a, a similar resolution and adopt that amongst all of the tribes in the uh, Pacific Northwest. So uh, I, I think that'll happen this spring. But just, um, just um, I forget that um, um, we do have to mention that um, this, is a, this is a spring time. This is a time that we're uh, reminded of renewal of, of life as, as our plants and trees start to come back. Um, from their winter sleeps. And, and so we have to recognize and, and we have to uh, listen again to Mother Earth and um, because um, it's, it's her way, it's, it's Mother Nature's way of telling us when things are wrong. And, and um, the people up in the Alaska, they, they were telling us a long time ago of climate change because of things that they saw in their communities, in their world. And um, unfortunately, people didn't listen to them um, to the extent that we're now in a in a existential crisis. So that has to be that what we're about as well. So we we try to include those kinds of issues with it within our work. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. Um, Joe, Dina, and you know, it's. You know, I think there's whatever you've been hearing. If if you want to kind of keep the conversation going between the three of you, I'll I'll just uh, keep myself on mute. I have a question, Elliot. That as you were talking, and this is going to get kind of in the into the kind of the meat of um, rights of nature stuff. Um, and you had talked about um, a, a resolution that the the tribal government, the the Nez Perce tribal government, is. Um, working with a resolution to, uh, or to introduce this resolution um, for rights of nature for the Snake River. Is that right? So did I, did I get that right? Right. Um, okay. And so, um, and so this is a, in a, um, you, if you do pass that, the Nez Perce will be the fourth tribal government to enact such uh, some kind of legal uh, approach to um, protecting rights of nature, the most recent with uh, the Karuks, I think, or was it the Yurok? I always get the two confused. Um, but 
the 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 along with the Poncas and then the Ho Chunks and the the Ho Chunks um, are attempting to change their constitution. My, so this is my understanding about it. They're attempting to change their constitution, whereas the others are uh, enacting um, resolutions. And I'm and I'm wondering um, if you can. I know this is kind of getting into the weeds about it, but I'm wondering if you could talk about the, the difference in approaches there. In our governmental structure, our constitutional structure that we've adopted, then um, the general council is, is made up of the people, um, the adults, and, um, and so uh, 18 years and older and um, uh, the tribal council then is is elected by the general council, and so it would be the policy of of the tribe then, and uh, that's that was why we we moved to make that adoption. But we also see in the longer term uh, constitutional amendment that would uh, uh, memorialize that kind of policy for. Uh, a longer period of time than than the than a resolution. So, I see both happening, and um, um, but that that would be a, a longer term strategy. Interesting. Thank you, Dina. I wanted to actually answer something you brought up, and it's it's the uh, it, it's the Yurok, uh, it's the Yurok and the Klamath River, and. Uh, I have a lot of good friends, Klamath, um, Yurok, Karuk, uh, um, and Hoopa, all, you know, folks all along the Klamath River and um, what they sought and what they have apparently achieved is personhood. So mm. it, it creates a, 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 you know, nature as a person. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's sort of reassuring in my heart to, to hear that and in, in that, that's what I do my best to promote is that, you know, we are as much nature as nature as us. Um, they've, uh, they've, you know, their, their, their efforts on the Klamath are, you know, they've, they've removed dams, they've worked, worked to remove more. Uh, and from the Yurok specifically, um, I've, I've been to ceremonies and, and, uh, the the relationship to the salmon as a product of the river is very much familial. Um, it's it's a blood tie. It's it's a connection that goes back to creation when Creator separated uh, the 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 salmon people from the human beings, and it it takes that and and it removes it from this world of sort of quaint uh, Indian story and makes it as real as anything else, and, which it of course is. Um, and, and actually I wanted to visit something um, else that was brought up and that's uh, the monster. What, what, tell, I wanna hear more about the monster. The, it, and it's, it must be about creation. Elliot, what were, you, what were you speaking of that you could see this, that you were, Yes, um, um, I live next to the heart of the monster and in monster. our creation story. Yeah, that's, um, uh, that's how we were created uh, because um, uh, there was a monster in the valley and he was uh, inhaling all of the animals and Coyote heard about that. And um, Coyote being the superhero that he was, when it went and uh, challenged the monster, it's well to um, um, to uh, to a challenge and told him to um, um, try to inhale him. And um, uh, Coyote, it, it's a yeah, yeah. He he uh, tied himself to several mountain peaks, and finally he was he was um, inhaled, but he had a knife. And uh, once he was inhaled into the monster's belly, then he cut them, cut the monster's heart and killed the monster. And that's when people came to the area and uh, came here. And um, um, he threw, he cut off the, 
the legs and threw that threw them towards a Montana country, and that's where the Blackfeet came up. They they have long legged people, and um, um, on and on, and and so that's how our our tribes were created as well. And um, I can recall when I was a student at the University of Washington in a history class, and um, they were proposing the history of, of populate, populating the North America. As you know, it was a Bering land sea bridge myth that was, uh, and uh, they were saying that was a way that uh, the uh, North America was populated. And of course I knew different. I knew that we came from the heart of the monster. So I raised my hand and, and told, uh, told our class that's where, that's where we, um, came from was we didn't come across any uh, Bering Sea and and so the science has finally determined that that is that has all myth. That, that was that was very much I think the point I wanted to make was that that um, the idea that there there's a single narrative about the origin of human beings uh, and that's the narrative you have to stick to is is a myth in and of itself and that we all have our own creation stories we all have our own places and you know as tribal people um our our place is is where we, you know who we are so um you know the, the klamath people are the klamath and the klamath is achieved personhood and if you ask a klamath person well where are you from what's your origin they, they can take you to that place you know, they don't have to look on a map and find a, you know, an imaginary uh, bearing land bridge as you were speaking of. Um, and I, I think it all very much ties together is this idea that there's, you know, that there really is a, for each, you know, for each tribe or band, a, an understanding of who we are and where we came from. And it's really not subject to argument or or um you know confrontation it's it's who we are and we get to say that <laughs> you know we have a right to be that and do that well, that's so one anyway of the, i wanted to honor that that's one of the big differences that i was speaking to earlier about the difference between indigenous societies here and the the foreigners that came from across the big waters was that um you know, and this is something that scholars will write about is that, you know, and, and Vine Delore was one of the earliest to, to point this out that you, we did not have, we did not fight wars of um, religion on this continent. Um, there was, a, a, you know, a deep respect for each community's beliefs because it was, because it is so tied to particular environments. Um, and it would be ridiculous to think that, uh, you know, or to for uh, one community who lives in, you know, the forested areas of what's now Oregon to tell the Pueblos of South, of the Southwest that their religion is wrong, right? Th that they're, um, that they're doing things wrong, that they're inferior, they don't worship the right God or whatever, because, um, because who they are it's just a, it's one of those common threads that that indigenous peoples always know that we are we emerge from particular places because we were placed there by by the creator um, and so um, so we're still up against this this uh, impulse of the foreign the foreign government, like the US government, we could say, um, and that system of thinking, that way of thinking and all the religious beliefs behind it that are so universalizing. And, and science is one of those kind of universalizing forces. It's always looking for absolute truth. It's always looking for the one explanation, the one truth that um, that all must be subject to. So um, um, without understanding the particularities of, um, of, of worldview and the ways that people understand themselves as existing in the world. Um, so this is, these are some of the, the things that are the hardest things to communicate. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons why indigenous 
uh, spiritual systems and, you know, religions, for lack of a better term, are not applicable to other people. They're not uh, straight across the board. They are not universal truths. They are truths that apply to specific people in specific contexts, in specific historical, uh, uh, you know, particularities and existence and language. So, um, so that that's, you know, that's how we have to think about the way that Joe you're describing it is so um, it's so uh, it's so familiar to me. I mean, uh, all Indian people, we all know this. We all hear similar similar um, kinds of talks. We all talk that way in our own in our own communities. We know who we are. We know where we come from. And um, I would never tell you that or tell Elliot that there's no such things as monsters. That's ridiculous. You know, like that you you don't even know you don't know what you're talking about i mean we in our in the the those monster stories by the way are common in uh in that in this part of the world in the northwest um on the columbia plateau so we have those stories too but um but those those stories those origin narratives those creation narratives are really um the importance of them is that they they tell other people, they signal to other people who people are and what their values are. Um, so the the meanings of them, they're not just, you know, feel good myths and stories and parables and things like that. They are, um, they are vehicles for, for expressing for conveying um, who people actually are. And um, I just might add that um, that's exactly what our people said back back in the day, um, as you all know, too, is as our history is similar, our the tribal histories are similar in that in that respect as well, because there is um, uh, early in the assimilation efforts of the of the United States to try to assimilate uh, indigenous people into the mainstream of America, as they said, would say um, they would send out uh, uh, religions to to the reservations and to as we'd say kind of save souls if you will or but uh get converts anyway and um uh, and that's what our people would be telling them don't make us argue spirit law you know and that's basically because uh, they were competing with one another um the the denominations but that is a current issue as well because uh, we've we've seen that ourselves, we have um, 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 we have sites on the reservation and in our seated area uh, where we went to seek a guiding spirit, and uh, those are sacred places. But we can't argue um, if if you do a timber sale by my uh, sacred site there then um, you're, I, I can't practice my religion because you're gonna desecrate it. Um, that, ha that has no standing in courts. Uh, so just like the rights of the Snake River, we need to be looking also at the rights to, for us to practice our religion, our, which, which um, uh, has sacred places in it. And so um, uh, when, when we hear people talk about uh, religious freedom and religious protections are they also talking about indigenous religions as well as protecting them there's Just an excellent an excellent movie called um in the light of reverence and i think a lot of people have seen that uh if you have not it i think it's it's important uh to see that that movie and see it's it's kind of return uh, it, it ties a little bit to what I was talking about in the sense that, you know, sacred places are resource rich to people who are looking to cash in on resources. So sacred places are resource rich to those who seek the sacred and they're, re, you know, they're rich in sacredness and all too frequently when people are looking for something like uranium or coal or timber, they encounter our sacred places as being concentrations of the health of those things or the existence of those things. 
And so there is a competing, um, a competing ideal of, you know, commercialization of a landscape versus sacredness of a landscape. And, you know, just by way of example, people climbing around on Mato Tipila um, and, you know, they have to sign a waiver that says we're going to completely ignore the religious beliefs or the, the spiritual beliefs of the, of the first peoples of this area because we want to pound our hooks or whatever they're called into the, the rock. They sign a piece of paper. They're perfectly fine with that. So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's an important film. I teach that um, film. I showed that film in a lot of my classes. Um, when I teach about sacred sites, even though, I mean, that film is um, like 20 years old now, but it's still just totally relevant um, because it gets to the heart of these issues and, and how um, the, the denial of religious rights for Native people is still happening. Um, Native people are the only people in the U.S. to not have freedom of religion. Um, to be persecuted for the religion that we practiced um, beginning in 1883 and lasting until the 20th century. Those, uh, those Indian, uh, uh, they call them the Indian um, code of crimes and they were about practicing religions and it wasn't really officially repealed until the passage of the Indian uh, American Indian Religious Freedom Act in 1978. Um, and even the, but even though we had that law passed, it's really one of those what they call a toothless law. It really doesn't uh, protect all of the, the aspects of our, uh, the needs that indigenous peoples have f that go along with the, the free exercise of, of religion. Um, an example of that would be um, the access to eagle feathers. Um, eagle feathers are, uh, you know, uh, are, are sacred in all native cultures. And, um, and we still have to have permission from the federal government to uh, acquire those, those feathers. And if you don't have that permission, um, there are heavy, heavy penalties and um, jail time. Um, that go with that. But, uh, but also going back to what you were saying earlier, Joe, about um, the, the protecting those sites, those forests, um, the, the Ling case in 1988 uh, is the law that set the precedent um, for the U.S. to, be, to go on um, violating those sacred sites um, because in that decision, the court said that um, the 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 clear cutting of a forest, the the cutting down of a forest, does not is not a violation of native rights to pr to practice their religion, even if the the conditions needed to to do those practices um, correctly um, are violated. So um, that's something that's never been. It, it, it still continues to be a massive obstacle uh, in, in the protection of sacred sites. So um, it's, it's, it's about uh, not just the access to the sites, like under, getting, gaining access to the sites, but about protecting the integrity, the, the environmental integrity of those sites. It's, and it seems to all, there, you know, there's a larger picture and it's, it's you know, really, uh, it kind of uh, harkens the the like the boarding school experience the the act of systematically separating a people from belief and understanding and and removing one personhood and replacing it with another based in religion so you know for it, it just seems like you know, that, that I would assume people know what that is, you know, the boarding school experience. It, it's, you know, it's children being taken from the arms of their parents. For, and this is, you know, this is happening still, uh, literally and figuratively thrown into an unmarked van and zipped off to an institution somewhere, haircut, uh, you know, regalia taken away, 
um, punished severely for singing songs, praying prayers. Um, you know, your, your person is taken away. Your spirit is removed from your body and mind and soul and replaced with one that is more malleable and, you know, can put a watch together better. So, um, it, it all in my mind ties, ties together. Um, you know, it, it, it's the rights of a human being to pursue happiness being taken away and human beings as in the natural world and as our place, you know, our rights are being violated in that context, not just in a, you know, human day-to-day -day context, uh, but as I was saying earlier, as people who are their place, are our place. Were there any other questions too that has come along, Kai? Yeah, I think we can we can move to that. Um, I'm just curious if if there are um, if there are sort of topics, uh, you know, cultural, contemporary, something that of which you, the three of you feel would would be of help tonight to 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 talk about to express. Um, I think things that come to my mind is, you know, what's the path ahead look like um, for, 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 for first peoples and uh, for first peoples for themselves. But as you mentioned, Elliot, you know, you know that you're connected to others in, in other places and that connectivity and, um, you know, what does that look like in your guys' view? Um, you know, we're here we are in 2021 you know, what does it look like 10, 15, 20 years or whatever sort of measurement of time as you guys think about it or as you think about it from the standpoint of your people, you know, what does that look like? And, and then, like I said, from there, we can we can clearly take questions from, from the audience. Well, I th think that, um, I think the message is becoming clearer, um, you know, with, with both Joe and, and Dina's comments about um, how, we're, how we're proceeding uh, proceeding on and, and um, um, you know, these, these uh, ideas that we have. And I, I think that they, that we can share, share that with a lot of people. And I think that they'll, they'll have that um, um, uh, feeling that they, that they can relate to it as well. So I don't think it, it's anything that foreign that people can't get on board with. And, and I, and I think that um, um, we do need we do need that paradigm shift in in how we uh, relate to Mother Earth, and um, uh, and so we've we've seen it, we've we've read about it, we've experienced it, and um, we need to um, do what we can to help change that because it isn't sustainable. And one of the things that isn't sustainable are, are the four lower snake river dams on the snake river we want them to be breached because that's not sustainable um it it just creates these reservoirs these stagnant pools behind them that are fish killers so um there are other ways to get get uh, grain and and other commodities to market without um killing all of our fish and killing the so um that that's contemporary uh, there's there's a um, thing called the Simpson Plan that's out by uh, Congressman Simpson from Idaho. He's a Republican, but uh, he proposes that that not only do we breach the dams, but we also um, work on on making these other entities um, right or full that uh, the farmers. Um, instead of barging, trying to barge their the grain down, they'll have to do it by rail and truck now and things like that, irrigation. Uh, but the one of the bigger things is hydroelectricity. Um, they claim that it's carbon free, but uh, it really, there are a lot of environmental costs to impounding and um, uh, they don't consider that cost when, when they talk about hydroelectricity. Plus, um, the alternative energy solution, I think, is going to be more prominent, and it already is 
gaining more prominence. The, the tribe itself has developed solar, uh, solar energy on, on, tribal, on tribal buildings. So uh, that argument is going to be, become clearer and clearer as we go along. But uh, there, are, there are negatives um, in the Simpson plan. And um, so we hope that, uh, that, that we can negotiate uh, with those, those types of issues about uh, um, uh, withholding lawsuits and things of that nature. So um, I, we still in um, the Simpson plan because it, it is actually the only action plan that's out there that would actually restore um, a good part, portion of the Snake River to a freer Snake River and um, release a lot, a lot of the, the habitat for fisheries. So uh, we support that portion of the Simpson plan. Uh, as far as the, the, the future, like what is, what needs to happen or what should happen um, I, I'm always looking at the big picture and, um, you know, for me, it's, it's about, you know, de it's decolonizing and, you know, what does that mean? And there's that, that's a huge conversation. Um, what does it mean to, um, to decolonize in a settler, in a colonial state, um, a state set up as a colonial institution? Um, and again, it, for me, it comes down to the, to the legal system um, that, that which we call justice needs to come to terms with these, uh, you know, archaic and barbaric laws uh, based on um, the, the barbaric doctrine of discovery, um, which is still the foundation of the system of federal Indian law. Um, so there needs to be a, a complete dis deconstructing and dismantling of that system and ways to, um, to reimagine, to reconfigure the political relationship between tribes and the state um, to where it began with, these, with the actual uh, recognition of sovereignty, the mutual recognition of sovereignty between um, distinct political uh, policy or political groups or polities. So um, there's, I have ways of thinking about that as a, you know, as a political scientist, um, somebody who studied um, systems of autonomy, global systems of autonomy, autonomy arrangements. Um, some call what we have now autonomy uh, tribal governments as a t autonomous governments. They're not really autonomous governments because they are circumscribed by the, the, um, the control of the federal government. So that's, that's what needs to change fundamentally and, um, and come to, there needs to be choices about what those political arrangements are um, between tribes and the federal government. But let's, um, let's, let's stop whitewashing the history and pretending that uh, that thing that we call sovereignty, tribal sovereignty, which is really a, a, a not, it's not real sovereignty. It's what they call limited sovereignty. It's, uh, it's prescribed. It's, it's the kind of sovereignty that the federal government will allow. Um, so, so these are the things we have to be, we have to be brutally honest about um, the actual reality of, of these, these legal uh, arrangements and political arrangements. So, um, so that we can go beyond that and get to, get to share, you know, real shared governance, like, and, and restored, um, restored, restored restoration to the land so that we can get those lands back to health. It's because indigenous peoples have that knowledge. Science has shown its incompetence when it comes to managing the lands on this continent. And that has to be uh, acknowledged too. Did you want to I have to, you know what, I have to, can I, just one thing? I have to seriously honor and acknowledge Dina and and Elliot's work. That they're you y'all are he, like huge picture folks um, in 
uh, scope of influence and the the tasks you're taking on, I, I feel like a little guy sometimes, and um, I, I struggle not to feel lesser because uh, I, I, I think what I you know what I do is important, and I guess it doesn't matter. We when we started out, we had five families participating. We were in charge of a piece of property that was about 200 acres, and about 15 of those acres are upland uh, oak savanna habitat, which is uh, crucial to the survival of Kalapuya people and many different tribal people of the Pacific Northwest. And we just, you know, it, it would be easy, I think, to see the catastrophic changes happening in the world around us and, and just sort of turn your head and go, okay, well, you know, I guess our posterity will be dealing with this, but no, you know, no, <laughs> we, we saw this as an opportunity, not as so much as a challenge. And, you know, we came together as a group to understand how important this tiny, tiny little piece of our historic world that was, you know, that was literally put here by, by the creator for us you know, how do we come together around it, this one tiny little piece at a time, you know, uh, it, I, it, it seems, you know, it, it, the more tiny little pieces you can put together, then, you know, it, then you start really achieving the, the goals you, you've set out to achieve and really start digging into, um, you know, that the, our connection with our place and the preservation of our place and and then everything becomes sacred you know if 15 acres of uh, upland oak savanna habitat can become the focus of the energy of five families then that's a sacred place and they you know they spread from there and other people realize how important this this is so I just wanted, really, I just wanted to say, wow, you know, uh, y'all are, are doing amazing things. And uh, that's all I have to say about that. Well, I would just say that I do what I do to help to protect the, the folks like you doing on the ground, on the land, doing the work. I'm not out there doing it. I would like to be. But I'm just sitting here in my office in a city in Orange County, you know, like I wish that I was doing what you were doing, to be honest. So, you know, I think that we're all working, you know, our work is all connected and we need each other to be doing this. We need to, to we, we support each other in all these very various and complex ways. Um, would the three of you be good with um, fielding some some questions and a couple of them came in here I'm, I'm not going to go super far back in the chat uh, one of them I saw was a question maybe with for Elliot where the uh, audience member asks do you feel that the tribal resolution for rights of the Snake River might be a tipping point for the state of Washington to remove the four lower dams so you talked about the Simpson plan but you know do you see that tribal resolution perhaps being a a way into those that uh, lower force, uh, you know, the, the dams on the lower Snake River. Well, we certainly hope it is, um, and we're we're gaining um, um, advocates all of the time. Um, I, I I saw another question about um, uh, forming with other groups and and uh, supporting one another and. Um, uh, in relationship to that. And, and one of the projects pre COVID that we did was called a flotilla. And we got together people from not only the, um, our, our um, uh, relatives from other tribes, but also uh, environmental groups um, and interested individuals and, and organizations. Uh, we had people from um, the Orca groups, so they came to our flotilla in a uh, Idaho here, and we had at one time I remember about 600 vessels in the water that uh, we were that we were all shouting breach the dams. So um, there are a lot of people that that support this as as being mm -hmm. um, in line with with Mother Earth, and uh, we 
And so we're going to continue advocating for the rights, not only of the river, but we believe that that will expand into other in, in a, into other protections of, of not only the river, but uh, species within the river and and um, because they're all connected and they're all all from the creator. So um, I hope it's a tipping point um, and um, and we're here to also encourage others to get involved, uh, support support one another and, and um, uh, write your Congress people and telephone them, email them, text them. Thanks, Elliot. Um, you mentioned uh, right your congressman. There was someone who put in chat what if you have any perspectives on uh, Deb. I always mispronounce her last name, Halan, from being appointed there by the uh, federal government or at that level, if that is helpful towards the decolonization conversation that we've been having. You know, how if you have any comments, any one of you about, about her appointment? Um, I've been asked this a lot lately and um i you know there's kind of a range of responses i think across indian country and in general it's sanguine it's really optimistic people are happy about it and i'm happy about it um i'm 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 i love it that we have a native woman that face of her she's a pueblo woman she's in charge of the department of the interior it's historic it's unprecedented it's amazing um and her politics are right she's um you know i trust her so um but that said um you know we cannot lose sight of the fact that her boss is still the federal government um and and it's and she is still operating within that legal structure that is built on the logics of um, our decimation of indigenous decimation in all these intricate ways and she's she's in a position she's in a political position and those you know politics is always about the art of compromise right so um so you know what in what kinds of ways is she going to be forced to compromise and what's that going to do for her um, for her standing in Indian country and she's going to make she's going to have to make tough choices for sure because she's got the the radical right now that she's battling against and fossil fuels which are whole, desperately trying to hold on to power as renewable energy um, resources come come into focus um, and you know, and all kinds of other things. So, um, so I, th for me, uh, I'm just a little bit more realistic. And I, you know, I think that she, she can do. I don't think she's going to do decolonizing work. I don't think that's part of her vocabulary. Um, but, you know, it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen. I think that she can, you know, the she will work for land protection and that's powerful and maybe she'll be able to to have some big influence on on re land return um of of those public lands you know in the western united states the 11 western united states um 48 percent of all the lands are public land so that's almost half almost half of all the lands in the west are owned by the federal government and that is all stolen indian land so um you know if she can have some influence on getting more and more of that land back into tribal um, jurisdiction then uh you know that alone would be amazing there was a, a question that maybe ties to that, Dina, um, where someone wrote um, FPIC, which I'm assuming stands for Free and Prior and Informed Consent, uh, seems to be considered the gold standard right now in the mainstream and advocacy groups. Should it be, is it a step in the right direction or does it reinforce the wrong perspective? No, it's absolutely the gold standard and it is the stand, the what needs to be worked for. Um, it's, it's in the deck, you know, the, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which the US in theory um, endorsed under Obama. But, but let us remember that it was Obama, the Obama administration that gave us Standing Rock. Um, so, um, you know, where was, where was that? Where was Obama? and that administration um, while they were granting permits to energy transfer partners um, for the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
Um, and, and in the end, it turned out that it was, you know, they, the, the courts ruled that just like the tribes had been saying all along, there had not been adequate consultation. So it's this, um, the tension between consultation and consent. Those are really big distinctions. And, um, and consent means veto power. And that's what they, even though they pay lip service to, you know, endorsing that in, in that declaration, um, you know, I think there's a lot of fear about, about uh, giving tribes that much power, but, but it is definitely gaining steam. People are latching onto it. Finally, I mean, it's only been 11 years since, since the Obama administration, you know, signed us on to the declaration. Um, finally, we're start, starting to hear, you know, uh, a real st a strenuous, um, you know, demands to adhere to that, to that standard. And, and yes, it's absolutely the right direction for us to go. There was another question specifically uh, to um, sort of the expansion of the, of the cell phone network, specifically 5G, someone wrote, how much awareness concern is there about health concern from exposure to microwave radiation from cellular transmission, 5G amplification versus allowing telecom installations being a source of income on tribal lands? So I don't know if you want to take that specifically or just this idea of other projects of that nature that supply revenue, but, you know, have repercussions. So I don't know who may want to jump in on that question. I'm going to do that because I'm not comfortable answering questions like this. <laughs> so I'll give it a shot. Um, I can only speak to what I know, but there is a recurring and constant pattern of uh it's it's coercion of sorts um convincing tribal people that there's a good thing that they can have with with excellent re results and somehow jobs and uh fairy dust and if they abide this they'll get that and frequently um it's it's the you know the the political aspects of it, the business acts aspects of it, are not um, coordinated through the people as a whole, but through uh, a few leaders or the uh, department, or you know, without the consent of the whole. And that's that's how you end up with a cell tower on your allotment. <laughs> And um, I, I can only, like I said, I can only speak to what I've observed, um, but that seems to be a pattern. It's like the treaties that were signed in Oregon in the early days of the treaty making period where, you know, we live in a village system in Western Oregon and uh, representatives of the government would approach a headman from a single village on a river drainage that, you know, under the auspices of representing the entire river drainage or the entire region and sign a treaty. And then lo and behold, the people downriver by the ocean find out that someone upriver that they've never met before or seen before has signed a treaty uh, agreeing to have everyone removed from their homelands. So I don't know. It, it just seems to be a pattern that I've observed in Indian country before. So... Um, I can comment a little bit about that, um, and it, I'll, I'll comment on the on the bigger issue, not so much a 5G um, deal going on, but um, um, that's one of the environmental justice issues that we have to deal with. Um, I live near Lewis, I work near Lewiston, Idaho, which has a, a paper mill and the prevailing winds bring that right onto the reservation. And um, we also have, uh, because we're rural, we have a lot of um, uh, what I would call bomb trains that come and store their uh, rail cars on the reservation. And uh, because when they, when they store them on, uh, within the urban areas, then they get graffitied up. So, if they bring them out to the reservation. So we need to be looking at, at our environment uh, and see how toxic of an, an environment that we, that we actually live on. 
and um, live in. And uh, we have to get, because uh, I believe that our people have a right to know that, that, you know, what kind of environment do we live in? Uh, what kind of water are we drinking? Is it, is it lead? Do we have lead in it? And, um, um, you know, and, and our uh, materials that we use, how much lead do we ingest all of the time? And, and uh, so I, I believe that um, we don't have that right now. We, we uh, even our foods, uh, we've come to uh, a point where we don't know where our foods are coming from and um, what's in our foods. And so that goes to our food sovereignty, our food security on the reservation amongst our people. Um, and so that's going to be an important aspect because it's, as we say, they're all connected. It's all, it's all connected with um, um, these. And um, we still have, um, as part of that community building, we're going to have to reconcile our histories with one another because of you, as you've noted, uh, not only intertribal, intertribal, but also within our communities, our history isn't something that you would actually want to write mom home about, you know, because of, of the things that happened. Um, um, and, um, and so we're going to have to reconcile that because uh, otherwise we're not going to be able to move on as com as a community with trying to have some kind of a unified vision of, of where we're all headed. So um, I think that the right to know movement, um, we have a right to know what we're putting in our bodies. We have a right to know uh, what we're breathing, what we're drinking. And uh, so I think that'll have a lot to do with informing folks about um, uh, their, our environment around us. Thank you, Elliot. We are we are at time. I don't know, Dina or Joe, if you have anything else you would like to, to share this evening. I'd like to give you the opportunity if there is anything additional before we, we sign off. I would just say that, you know, thank you for coming here and hearing our perspectives. Um, our perspectives have not always been re well received by um, the non-native uh, population, um, and and I and and I because they're hard truths. They're hard truths to hear, and um, it's not about inflicting guilt, right? That's not what this is about. It's not about um, you know guilt tripping people for where they come from or who they came from, but how we together imagine a better future, uh, and um, and the only way that we can do that is is through um, the processes of honesty and uh, and and equity, um, and um, and understanding, you know, the the knowledge that Native people have had and deferring to it. Um, Western science doesn't have all the answers, so um, yeah. So it's really we need to listen to each other and have the courage to move forward in ways that um, that empower Native people. That's really where, that's how we're going to get through this. That's, I, you know, I, that's how it looks to me. But thank you for being here and thank you for listening. Yeah, Dina, thank you and Joe and, and Elliot for your time. And um, yeah, I appreciate you guys feeling comfortable enough to, as you say, talk about the hard truths. And um, clearly there are many more discussions to come, uh, large and small. And and eventual actions and, and really changes in behavior from, from all angles and all places. So I, I think tonight was a, an indication of, of the possibility in, 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 a, in a good way. So I uh, appreciate the three of you and all that you brought tonight. I, I know a lot of the great comments in the chat about that as well. And um, we will have a recording of this to share out that will come out very soon. Uh, so uh, please send it far and wide, I, regardless of, of being here live. I think this is a, a conversation that will hold for some time. And so uh, please share it with others. Um, I think with, with that, we're, we're going to close it off for the evening. We try to keep these things to, to an hour and a half uh, to respect for people's time. So on behalf of the ORCRN and CELDEF, um, thank you again for attending. And most of all, Dina, Joe, and 
Elliot, thank you for, for your time and, and your wisdom this evening. Much appreciated.